everyone. Welcome back to the Honest Athletes podcast. We are on episode six, I think. So we're we're doing nicely. I think we noticed the other day that we have a lot of sprint freestylers on the podcast this season. It seems to be the sprint freestyle season, which is pretty exciting. We've got some legends and one of those is joining us today. So I would love to introduce Anna Hopkins to the podcast. Anna, how are you? Please intro yourself. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm really good. Um, yeah, currently in Australia on a training camp, so avoiding the horrible weather back home. But um, yeah, I'm Anna Hopkin, GB swimmer and sprint freestyler. Um, main events are 50 free and 100 free. And I guess my biggest achievement to date is uh, Olympic gold at the Tokyo Olympics in the mixed uh four by one medley relay um and then i guess i've had an interesting journey which i'm sure we'll get into but um kind of prioritizing education and coming up through the ranks being a little bit older um and kind of making teams a bit older i kind of skipped the whole uh junior um part of the swimming career which is quite interesting but um yeah kind of at a point now where I'm just seeing how far I can get with it really. Now I know people who are listening but anybody who is who's listening and maybe not able to see the uh the YouTube video you are incredibly tanned right now it's (laughs) it is awesome and I guess that's one of the best (laughs) being a you know an international athlete where you get to go and travel and go to some amazing countries and have a second summer out in Australia um so just kind of want to touch a little bit upon what you said there about your junior career as a swimmer. So take us back to, I guess, at the beginning, what kickstarted swimming for you? Uh, and did you enjoy it as much as you did now? do now? Or was it a very different story for you back then? Yeah, I think it's kind of a mixture. Um, I guess I initially got into swimming, I think I was probably eight when I joined my first club in Chorley. But obviously prior to that, I've done typical swimming lessons and etc and I've got an older brother so we kind of joined the club at the same time so I guess I was quite young when I joined um and I loved it at that point and I think I'd been told I had a bit of a a knack for fly actually um so I was kind of always a fly swimmer and did all like the micro leagues and 25s and all that fun stuff and like loved it um and kind of focused more on the 100 fly and went up to the 200 fly when I was sort of probably 11. Um, And I trained at Chorley for till I was sort of 10, 11 and then moved to Gallica, which is a more serious squad, I think age 10. So I was still very young when I moved to that squad and that was quite a big step up. Um, I think looking back now, it was maybe a little bit early to kind of do that because I did all sorts of other sports um which I loved as well and kind of it's quite young to specialize on a on a sport and an event so um but I did enjoy it there uh for sort of the first couple years and then I moved up to like the top squad at age 12 which I think that was kind of the turning point for me like I had to then kind of stop all my other sports it was kind of like this is swimming it this is it now um and I was 12 and I was in a squad with much older people who were kind of aiming for the Olympics and it all just seemed a bit like I don't know if that's what I want to do I'm not sure yet so um I think at that point I started to just almost resent swimming a little bit for kind of making me stop other sports and um like I didn't get much social life and all my friends were like going home from school and doing stuff after school and I had to go straight to training, getting up at 4am and driving to Manchester. It was just like a lot at that age. So um, yeah, I stopped at 13 and just kind of ticked over um, at Blackburn, um, joined loads of other sports that I kind of missed, did gymnastics, uh, running, trampolining, cheerleading athletics um just a bit of everything really just to kind of go completely the opposite direction um and still swam a little bit but I think it was just I knew at that point I was like I'm really not enjoying this and 
I didn't know at that point where I was going to come back into it again but I just knew at that point in time I was like I need to step away from this for now but um yeah I mean I think it's just hard when you're young kind of trying to balance everything that's going on yeah I think you're absolutely right with that one it's a very young sport to start the early mornings and the the kind of busy regime of, of training that swimming brings and I always kind of because obviously we were very close you were training at Manchester at Gallica when you mentioned Gallica then I was like whoa yeah. that's a blast from the past <laughs> so that's really nice to hear and you use the word resentment there which is so common in swimming but isn't actually talked about that much so it's really interesting to hear that um kind of that kind of feeling a little bit of all well, the social side you miss out on that in life and stuff like that when you're younger so your story is actually some something that people could really learn a lot from because obviously you've come back and you mentioned before olympic gold so we will definitely touch on that you swam with i think dave heathcock was it for a year yeah um so I went to I started at Bath University in 2014 so that was kind of the year before I went to Bath University was the point so I was 17 at that point where I was like I'd quite like to have a sport at university that I'm part of the team and I'm competing and I'm doing books and stuff so that was and swimming's all I know swimming's always been the sport that I've been best at it's just I like doing lots of other sports as well so that was kind of like okay like I'll pick up my training a little bit the year into university I need to post some times because obviously they're not going to take me into the team having not raced in five years or something so um yeah I just did some competitions obviously I wasn't going to do the 100 200 fly anymore um having not trained too much I was training probably like twice a week um and I had a really great coach at Blackburn who he just kind of helped me enjoy it again and we really focused just on sprint fly really um and he used to be a bodybuilder so he was the first person that ever introduced me to like lifting weights obviously I wasn't doing anything stupid but I'm sure he did when he was bodybuilding but it was just he knew the techniques and he knew how to kind of introduce me to lifting weights so um I also did a bit of boxing with him and just all this power stuff which I was like oh this is actually really fun I like being a sprinter um and so I just did the 50 fly really posted some like pretty decent times which um Mark Skimming at his coach at Bath he was like yeah we can have you on the team so that was kind of where it really got going again in terms of competition um and when I was with Dave Heathcock was with on placement year so I'd been two years at Bath and then a year where I went on placement so I was like working full-time living in Ealing and training with him and then I went to back to Bath again for my final year so I have kind of chopped and changed with coaches quite a lot I moved around a lot as well. Yeah, well, and and that's, again, really interesting because it's not your normal, you went to a club, you stuck there, you trained hard, you had this one coach and all that kind of stuff. So um, I'd love to get some insight on that. But the reason I bring up Dave is because I remember the year you were with him and my mum knew Dave through old old swimming days when they used to do all crazy things like yeah. flight and woolly jumpers and all that. But um, Dave said, uh, I remember chatting to him and I, I really liked Dave and he said to watch out for you that you were going to be like a star. And he said, he, he talk about you a lot with me. So um, I was always, I've always been aware of what you're up to, your journey, like watched you kind of come through the ranks really and obviously do amazing things. Um, but I really wanted to bring that up today because I thought it's really important to kind of let you know that yeah like yeah. we're talking about oh, you from, so... for, for a while yeah I mean Dave like I think he that was probably a bit of a turning point for me um obviously I'd been two years at Bath but was very much sprint fly and fi like 50 fly 53 focused had a bit of a go at the 100 but I was still kind of building back up my um sessions per week getting a bit more volume a bit more aerobic endurance and all that so the 100 was kind of just you know giving it a go um and Dave was the first person that really mentioned about making British teams to me and he was like you you know this was 2017 so it, w it was the world championships that year which I never even wasn't really on my radar because I was like 
that surely there's no way I'm going to make that and he was like that's like the ultimate goal if we don't make that then there's world university games uh which I think you can definitely make um and I kind of knew a little bit about world university games but I mean it's just like that'd be amazing to make any kind of team so he was kind of the first person that really I guess focused me like it gave me like a, a goal like to make a team and um it was a little bit that year was quite difficult in a way because I was working full time and obviously in London cl like clubs in London it's quite difficult for them because they're training in multiple different pools all over the city you've got to like get a bus to one, one or a tube to another or, or a, I was biking some places so it was kind of I would turn up the trend can would allow it and Dave was just really good at being flexible and um just kind of giving me what I needed with also working as well so um yeah he's really great and I'm still in contact with him and it's kind of nice to just have all these different coaches that I've come across over my career and they're all rooting for me and when I, I see them on poolside and they're all really happy for how I've done and it's just nice to kind of share that with them. I think having that balance and having a coach who's so understanding and for your particular um situation it, it's really good when you've got somebody that's on side and willing to work with you because I guess the easiest thing is everyone just does the exact same thing so to have that sort of individual flexibility I think is really 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 helpful and um one thing as well that be kind of intriguing from your point of view a lot of athletes when they go through their teenage years I mean the fact that you do so many other sports as well um love to know which one was your favorite if you had a particular favorite of the other activities that you did but the other one was how did you balance I guess doing all those other activities and your studying what was your did you have like uh not like a routine but was there something that allowed you to get that balance so that you could both do your activities and your study um it's a question that gets asked a lot I guess a lot of kids want to know how you balance training and coping with school um so from your point of view what what worked for you yeah so I think for me like it was never I loved being busy so obviously training so many times a week um wasn't really the issue I mean it was kind of nice when I took that away and did other sports if I kind of wanted to do something with friends it wasn't like you have to turn up to training it was kind of like this is all my decision now like if I want to do something with my friends instead of going to running club that day then that's okay um but I was still doing so many sports I was um I think some days I would go to school and then my mum would pick me up from school and I would she'd take me to running club I'd eat my tea in the car on the way and then after that she'd take me straight to cheerleading which is straight after and I'd always turn up to cheerleading with like a bright red face because I'd just been running and then I'd do cheerleading and so I think I loved being busy but I just liked the variety that was kind of more of the the thing that I didn't get with swimming when I was younger um and obviously you meet a lot of different people in all the different sports so it was definitely definitely had a routine I kind of knew what I did each day and knew where my free time was obviously if I needed to catch up on work or um obviously always had weekends to kind of catch up on studying and stuff and I think the big one was really like my mum just ferrying me around having dinner in the car bringing changes of clothes just um I mean I'm quite an organized person so like if I knew I had whatever activity that day you know I'd pack all my pack a bag ready for her to bring for me like snacks whatever she'd bring dinner things like that so I think if you know you're gonna be busy you just have to plan ahead and make sure you've got time but I think the great thing with that was if I had exams coming up I could just take a day off and just focus on studying because for me like education was at that point the priority really um all the activities were just fun um and so I think I definitely prioritized my education <laughs> in high school and then into college I think I just stepped back a bit with my um training I think just I knew I wanted to go to Bath University I knew I wanted to do sports science that was kind of like my main goal at that point so um, doing well in exams was really important for me um and A-levels was 
quite challenging so it was just kind of doing what I needed to do to get into university and obviously I was still doing uh, lots of clubs and things but just um, for me like the education was the priority at that point. Sounds like you've managed to balance and you've you've managed to get into good routines through your life really and be organized and get everything ready and all that kind of stuff and that's one of the things that I always say to athletes or anyone that asks those kind of questions it's just it's just about being organized really knowing what's coming up yeah and and the the team around you knowing that as well uh, making everyone aware that honest communication so that's that's really good to hear and hopefully anyone that's listening parents or athletes listen up because it's important <laughs> uh, that's how you do it now I feel like we've jumped a little bit around but what I'd, I'd love you to do if, if you don't mind is kind of give us a quick overview of your time in swimming because you learned to mm-hmm. swim obviously like hopefully everyone does <laughs> and then you you went into other sports and then you came back to swimming, kind of. I know you could never fully left, but and then and just just give us an overview of that, and also what coaches you've worked with, because I think that'd be really interesting of like who you've actually worked with, and and maybe some things that you've learned through that. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so I obviously joined the Chorley Marlins at age eight, and went to Gallica at age ten, and so you're still like part of the club when you're in Gallica. Um, but then I moved to Blackburn Centurions just because it was, they were more supportive of me being in Gallica. I think Chorley was a very small club and they kind of felt like Gallica was almost stealing me from them, even though I still represented them at competitions. Um, and there was a lot of people at Gallica who were at Blackburn at the time. So it kind of just made sense to move clubs at that point. Um, and my coaches at Gallica were um, John Dougal and Rob Greenwood. Um, and yeah, I think, I mean, I still see Rob around actually. I think he's working in Spain now, but um, he worked with like, I mean, Steph Slater, she was with Rob for quite a while. Um, I trained with like kind of in the same group as her when I was getting towards the end of my time at Gallica Steph's uh, Dan in- oh, yeah so nice <laughs> um Dan Savinsky I don't know if the he was he was kind of just like yeah <laughs> yeah he was like so sort of, he was so close to making I think it was 2012 was he he was like and then he got injured or something um yeah it was like a really big group of really talented people and that they were kind of the ones I was when I moved up at age 12 or obviously at the peak of their career at that point so it's kind of like quite daunting for me to be in the same group as them um but then when I obviously left Gallica I trained at Blackburn probably two or three times a week um with well, I've had all sorts of actually you know, Andy Addison and um Rick Hall they were both like assistants at Gallica when I was there. And then I think they both did a bit of time at Blackburn. Um, and then Lee Oral was like, he kind of got me going again with competing when I got a bit older. He was the one that was the bodybuilder, introduced me to the gym and everything. So that was kind of probably like 17 when I was like starting to compete a bit more again I mean I always did arena leagues for them but Blackburn were in quite a low league at that point so it was very much like really shallow pools with no blocks and stopwatch timing and stuff so I don't know if I really count that (laughs) Um, but then after Blackburn when I went to Bath I had Chris Alderton who then moved to Bath Aquasulis after Um, he was the one that kind of we got going with like real sprint training um because the pool at bath was being refurbed and so we had to train in this school pool um like it was like really shallow really warm not the best pool to train in and so they split the groups like distance and middle distance went to bristol to train in the 50 meter pool and the sprinters trained in this little school pool but it actually was like the best thing for me because I was still getting back into training again 
and all you could really do in this pool was just sprint because it was too warm to do much aerobic stuff um and we didn't have loads of pool time in the week we only had six sessions a week and I only did three of them so um just pure pure sprint um and you know I was still improving because it was still more than I'd done before um and then Mark Skimming was heading up the lot in Bristol the kind of mid distance guys and so I was pretty much with Chris until I moved to Dave um on placement year in Ealing and then when I came back to Bath I started with Mark um trained with him for that final year and then um it was actually a connection through Dave Heathcock that um Neil Harper who's the coach in Arkansas America he knew one of the coaches at Ealing and so he got in contact with Dave um and just asked if I'd be interested in going out to America to swim and do a master's for two years so that was like 2018 to 2020 and I think at that point I was kind of in my career I was doing quite well like in terms of making teams I'd made Commonwealths made Europeans in 2018 but you know I wasn't good enough to be at a national centre or be on funding um I didn't quite know how I was gonna keep swimming I knew I wanted to keep swimming but I didn't know how to do it without getting a job and so the opportunity to go to America and get a master's and it was all paid for and you know amazing facilities I was like yeah why not <laughs> um and Neil was is he swam on the British Olympic team so he kind of knew the ins and outs of qualifying and knowing that I needed to prioritize the trials and things like that so um I always like think that that's another reason that Ealing was quite a big turning point in my career because it introduced me to Neil who um obviously went there for two years and that's when I dropped a lot of time made the world championships team in 2019 and then um obviously the aim was he would take me through to Olympics but then obviously because of COVID I had to move back and um I'd already been introduced to Mel quite a lot at that point so that was the next kind of obvious transition and Mel and Neil had had a lot of chats and they get on really well and the transition was really really smooth and kind of obviously she moved me on even more so that's pretty much where I'm at now obviously still with Mel now so wow that's uh that's <laughs> yeah a lot of coaches <laughs> But I think what's really refreshing is that each one that you've talked about, you've seen the good from it. It's not been, oh, you've just been club hopping because they couldn't give you this or they couldn't give you that. You've seen the positives and it's you You can see the evolution of you know who Anna Hopkin now is and the journey that you've kind of been through. And each coach, each club that you've been to have given you that little edge, that little bit that's part of your story. And it's so refreshing to see that um and you know your appreciation for the smaller clubs because I do feel when you do get onto the stage of you're in a bigger club sometimes the smaller clubs not that they intentionally get forgotten about but it is so important that that foundation that they build actually does can create some incredible athletes and you're kind of proof of the pudding there it's uh it, it's it's amazing to see that now for for us I think it'd be really exciting to hear about your time in America episode one we were speaking yep. to Craig he did kind of briefly touch upon swimming short course yards um what's it like having swimming short course <laughs> yards compared to short course meters and long course beers yeah it's quite different it was like I mean it was in in a way it was great because every time I raced I was PBing and so you almost got that like age group feel again where um you just felt like you were swimming fast all the time because you were just PBing time after time um but I think it was also really refreshing for me like I felt in 2018 that was kind of a big year for me in terms of making teams but I didn't perform the way I wanted on the big stage like I didn't do my PBs on kind of at Commonwealths and Europeans um and I I just felt like I was ready for a drop um but I just didn't kind of come that year and I thought that year was it was going to come so when I went to America, it was just kind of a reset almost um, because I wasn't racing long course. I wasn't racing short course meters. There was like nothing to compare it to. And I think sometimes I'm definitely a bit of an overthinker and like I compare, oh, what was I doing this time last year? 
um what was I doing in training this time last year and if it's slower what what's going on what's happening it's kind of all going through your mind whereas going short course yards you just have nothing to compare it to and so I just that's just mental side of it just was not there and so it was just kind of fun and lots of racing and um you know people were telling me I was swimming fast I didn't really know what fast was um what yards but um when it came to like the conference championships you're up against people who are making the olympic team and um the national like american national team so it's really really high quality especially like ncaa's so you get some really high quality competition but the way they do it it's just you know you have your chance and um it's just it's, it's kind of chaotic but it's just very very different to any kind of british meet like you compare it to books it's just on another scale like it's so loud and every the, like entire team are like getting behind you it's yeah it's a lot a lot of fun I would recommend it to anyone but um I think the way they do their season it's very different because you're doing all these dual meets so almost every other weekend we were racing and that meant a lot of at least my training is very much either all out sprinting um very like high quality fast sprinting we did a lot of like kind of weighted swims resistance uh assisted stuff or just kind of aerobic meters we didn't really do much like threshold or vo2 type stuff um just because we were always needed to be ready to race and it actually i never really trained like that before but it it really worked for me um and even when I came to do trials that first year, so 2019, I think I'd raced long course once maybe. And then um, I raced at trials and dropped like 0.7 off my 100 PB or something. So I, I felt, I was like, I don't, obviously you do need the long course training and you need race practice and things. But I think, I don't know, it's just like, you don't forget how to race long course you know you're still getting the meters in doing yard swimming and training you're still getting the race exposure and then just kind of put it all together in long course format I guess it was it's quite strange but um just yeah really refreshing I absolutely love that because I think there is a lot of I know you said you're an overthinker but I think there is a lot of overthinking in swimming of like I haven't raced long course in two days mm -hmm. I've lost it yeah. that's it that's <laughs> it. it's over so it's yeah. nice to hear that yeah you don't really need to do it because you know it's uh you remember it's there it's always there um the pool's just a little bit longer obviously it is yeah bit but um but no it's good to hear that really important so you've said that the American system works for you. Clearly it did. Have you managed to, did you have talks with the coaches back home and from when he came back? So obviously that'd be with Mel. And have you managed to emulate a little bit of that or, or replicate it in some sort of way? Or have you kind of switched that up now completely since coming back to the UK? Um, I think especially Olympic year, because obviously um I came back from America in March 2020 when kind of flights were shutting down and everything I just flew back um and pretty much instantly joined Mel's squad but, but it was all I had one week in Loughborough with Mel as soon as I arrived in the UK which seems crazy now like obviously there was no quarantine there was no and it was just I just kind of landed and went training um which obviously then didn't happen for like two more years but um yeah I trained with them for a week and then it was locked down and so then I was like in the group but it was all online and on zoom and we were doing gym circuits on zoom and going for runs and then I had um the like endless pool in the garden um so I had like Mel on FaceTime while I was just swimming on a bungee cord kind of thing so it was quite weird to like join a new squad but not be kind of doing the traditional kind of training um but her and Neil had spoken a lot and Neil's like a really really great coach and very I don't know he's just like 
saves all his sessions and he just emailed her just endless like attachments of sessions we did and times when I did them and stuff that really worked for me stuff that might have not and so just gave her loads and loads of information um checklist of things that he would work on if he was still coaching me kind of thing so they've always been very transparent with each other and I think I think that's really important obviously it can be hard for a coach when they lose one of their swimmers and sometimes it's I don't know there's maybe a bit of tension but there was never any of that and Neil's since come um did a session with like Mel's group and he got a lot from kind of chatting with Mel and seeing what she does and stuff so that was really great and I think she still chats to him if she's ever in doubt of a session I might be doing or she just wants advice on maybe something I've done in America um and then we have like turning boards that you can put onto the lane ropes so when I first moved to Loughborough I'd actually swim short course yards quite a lot um so if we had a short course meters session put the turning board in at 22 and a half meters and I just swim short course yards in my lane, um, which actually worked quite well because there's a lot of boys in Mel's group. And so I would just go off their turnarounds, but obviously I'd, I'd be equivalently, I could kind of be with them because um, it's just that little bit shorter. Um, and I guess I don't do that so much now just because it's kind of been phased out a little bit, but we still do quite a lot of short course work. Um, and I'd say the training is, it's obviously different, but it's still very much like lots of fast stuff, um, lots of technical high quality stuff. Um, and then the kind of aerobic side, like I still, I do do lactate kind of threshold sessions and things, but I don't tend to do the big like aerobic threshold type work because that's just something I've probably never really done in my whole career like maybe a little bit at Gallica that kind of 7k aerobic you do when you're in age group but it's just not something that has really really ever been part of my training so um last year we did experiment a little bit with kind of what I could tolerate and it was very good information like to learn and what can you take and stuff but I didn't swim quite as well as I wanted to last year so I think that's something we've kind of taken on board this year and trying to mix it up a little bit that's really interesting and again it goes back to that every athlete is different what one sprinter can do doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to work for somebody else um and for you and I hope you don't mind me saying but also your size you're not one of the sort of amazonian six foot two dutch swimmers that we sometimes see when it comes to sprinters you know you are well, according to Wikipedia, you're 165 centimetres, so about five foot five. Is that right? Or, yeah. Yeah, five four, I think. It's about right. Yeah. I think I might be so, like six three. Yeah. Wikipedia's and, given me a little bit more height. <laughs> <laughs> so, for me, I think it was really important there was you were talking a lot about that high quality technique, and every time you sprint or any hard work that you do, it is intense. So, for me I've always said sprinting is about being a perfectionist it's about perfecting the stroke the technique it's about minimizing the number of mistakes you make um and it doesn't matter what size you are it is about that quality of technique that's going to really pull you through and watching you race in Tokyo was just phenomenal um your natural talent and your ability to race you can see hearing your story you can see that all piecing together for that moment um I kind of want to just jump on to I guess that Olympic journey for you and what was it like because I guess it's the first Olympics we've had in the situation with COVID there were obviously a lot of restrictions with what you guys could and couldn't do the amount of COVID tests I think you guys had to go through as well um could you give us just a little insight as to what it was like up until that that spectacular four by one medley mixed relay race yeah it's it's kind of a mix of emotions because obviously you want to enjoy everything it is about making an olympic team like when you get your kit and trying everything on and just getting excited about actually going but you've just always got in the back of your mind that 
if I test positive for COVID, like I might not be able to go and what would happen. And it's just, it was almost like, just, we just need to get there and get through the first race. And then like, you're an Olympian kind of thing, because at any point you could just be pulled out because you've got COVID or something. So, um, yeah, like you say, we had to test every single day from being in the holding camp to obviously the end of the Olympics so you're just like just praying you're not gonna hear like it's, it's a negative test because I mean it was a saliva test so it wasn't like a it wasn't like a PCR or lateral flow so you just you spit in a tube every morning sounds a bit gross but and then you drop the little test tube off um each morning and so it's not like you're waiting for a red line or something you don't no like you just drop it off and obviously if you hear back that it's bad news then you know it's not great but um like the British team was so careful like everything we did it was kind of the two weeks prior to leaving we were told just to completely like go to the pool to train just do online shopping don't go in any shops um if you had housemates that weren't on the team um like I moved into an Airbnb for a week with some of the other swimmers um because I had a housemate who was like mixing with other people um because obviously she has a job it's like you wouldn't expect her to kind of sacrifice all that because um I need to isolate but um and then obviously so we were like we were very very careful um and then my parents came and they like camp nearby Loughborough and so I could like go see them but was all socially distanced and things and it was just very very odd but it, it was nice like to kind of at least see them before I left because obviously they couldn't come out there like they would have loved to go go watch and things but obviously there was no spectators there so um yeah once we were there it's kind of I guess a little bit in the safe because you were just surrounded by the the team that like the swimming team so it would have been very kind of low risk environment really um and obviously we weren't allowed to leave the facility where we were training before we went into the village um and all the transport and everything was very safe and we were wearing about three masks on the plane to make sure we didn't pick up anything and just hand sanitizer and all of that but there's always that little risk but um it was actually organized really well like in the village they had screens in the dining hall so when you were eating there was like almost a box around you so there was no you could talk to people but it was really hard to hear because you had these like clear screens between you so that was quite odd um but other than that like because you knew everyone was testing every day and we were in a flat with like the other swimming girls so it kind of felt special in its own weird way and obviously when you when you get down to competing it's still olympic games it still feels really special um and at least towards the end of the week you got more athletes coming to watch like swimmers who'd finished or people coming to support so there was a little bit of atmosphere and noise um around it so like i didn't have anything to compare it to because obviously it was my first olympics but to me it still felt really special Roll on Paris, eh? Hey? <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, roll on the... Paris. But, <laughs> but better to do the way round, so you do that one mm -hmm. first. Um, and yeah. then the next one will be a breeze, hopefully. Yeah, um, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, so the fact that you won a gold medal at the Olympics, we should not just kind of skirt around. What was that like? Because that is what everybody kind of wants to achieve in swimming. Like that's the the pinnacle. You're stood on the top of the podium at an Olympic Games. Just talk us through that experience, please. Yeah, it was very, very surreal. Like obviously that relay for us has always been a very, very strong relay. Um, and particularly that year, like at Europeans, we'd gotten really close to breaking the world record at Europeans and so that was probably I don't know if it really sunk into me that like I could be on the end of that relay at the Olympics and like we are the best in the world we've nearly broke the world record like 
I never I don't think it ever once crossed my mind that like I could be on the end of the relay and we could win a gold medal like which is probably a good thing because um it's quite a scary thought but also you know I had to that you know make sure I was the one that was picked to be on that leg so that was kind of the main hurdle to get over you know I had to swim well in my individuals to make sure that I was the one that they wanted on the end of that relay and it wasn't until um I was told like you're the one going on the relay that it kind of started like going in my brain like oh my god I could get an Olympic medal like I don't think I even thought like oh my god I could get a gold medal like it was just like I could get a medal this is ridiculous like can't believe I'm in this position um but I think going into the race I just, like everyone I think because we'd had such a good week so far like everyone was swimming really well I had a lot of confidence in the way I was swimming um and I mean Jimmy and Adam had already won gold medals and they were on the team with us so like it almost felt quite chilled in a way and they were great because obviously me and Kathleen it's our first Olympics going for an Olympic gold medal it's quite a scary situation to be in and I think there was the potential for especially with the mixed relay there's all the lads in the call room as well for it to be a very scary situation but Jimmy and Adam were great at just they were just like just enjoy it like you've swam this race multiple times this week already you're doing really well you've swam good times it's like just just imagine you're just swimming into your 100 free again like as a race don't worry about who's next to you or you know if you're going in first like don't worry about the fact that you might be about to win a medal just swim the race as if it's just a normal 100 free and I think that really definitely helped calm us down a little bit but um it was quite weird for me being the one that actually touched the wall and like because it's not in my nature to like get up on the lane rope and like splash the water and stuff and I hadn't it just didn't even cross my mind that I was going to be in that position so when I did touch the wall I was like oh, what do I do <laughs> like, this, like just like I think I was just smiling and like just couldn't quite believe it and just just waiting for the others to like so I could kind of congratulate them and just hug them and stuff but I didn't well obviously the camera was on me so I, was, I just didn't really know what to do <laughs> for me that lasting image of that slow-mo like the last three meters you coming into the finish it's it, it, it's still so clear in my mind as well um <clears throat> so you know you've achieved pretty much what any athlete would love to aspire to which is hearing your national anthem being on the podium slow my shot at the end regardless of whether you sit on the lane <laughs> like, the fact that you kind of keep repeating you know you, you know you could you had the potential but you didn't like overly think about it for someone who like you say you overthought thought about things you just knew it was another race albeit at Olympic Games um yeah. it, it's really really special to hear you you know cope and handle with that type of pressure like it was it was just another race for you and you guys absolutely smashed out the park it was uh it was pretty spectacular so what about coming home what were the emotions like when you uh you know you basically coming home with this uh extra piece of luggage for yourself yeah I think obviously I would have loved for my family to kind of be there to celebrate at the time and I facetimed them as soon as I got the medal obviously they were it's like probably 3 a.m for them or something so they were obviously up watching it so then as soon as I got the medal I FaceTimed them um but then it was kind of I think we had a couple more days there um before we came back and then yeah we had like a little homecoming thing where all friends and well mainly fa family a couple of friends could like come and just greet you off the coach from the um from the airport so it was like instant I got to see them straight away which was really really nice and kind of show them the medal straight away and I think it was almost more special because of the situation and the fact that they couldn't be there and everything with COVID like we'd kind of finally made it and everything had gone well like better than expected and just to finally be able to share it all with them was really special um but I think we were all incredibly tired because we'd obviously just had a huge flight I hadn't really slept much just like celebrating and 
and then you have to do media and it's just all very overwhelming I was just kind of waiting for just a point where we could just like go home and then it's just like you and your family and you can like properly just unwrap it all and like just kind of tell them everything that's happened and just go through it all so that was kind of the more special moment love to hear that and obviously it's those moments that you remember the most really it's time with family and friends and stuff after you've done something so incredible so great memories I'm sure for you and um, before you came on to this podcast Hannah and I were having a conversation and we were saying what's really nice about you Anna is that you seem to just have just got your head down and just got on with it and then kind of done your talking in the water but also not you, you just kind of seem to like I say just get on with it it's great it's just you train hard you race Mm -hmm. hard you seem absolutely lovely really humble and it's just so nice to see really refreshing um so thank you a very good role model for those up and coming through the British swimming ranks I suppose now I'm not letting you go before I ask this question (laughs) you found great success on the British team but you also seem to have found love I think oh god (laughs) so Anna what's that like having found someone who is also on the British team Luke who I did do a little bit of training with because they used to come and train with Stockport a few of the 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 swimmers um who is lovely he's always been so lovely what's it like and what's it like when each other races and are you competitive with each other at all like you're like well you know I've got Olympic gold and come on Luke (laughs) step up so what's that like everyone loves love come on I had to ask yeah I guess it's I guess it's like a it's a bit of both like obviously it's good because you know what each other are going through um I think probably hard for Luke when I'm doing like 4k and he's got a 7k session (laughs) so I think that's probably harder for him but um yeah I think like it's it's just nice to have someone who's been through the same thing and you're training together um I guess there's always the potential for like you're spending too much time together but we've we've done all right so far uh no major fallouts Mel's very invested and she's like um, you guys can never break off it would just <laughs> everything so it's quite funny but um uh I think at competitions it's nice just to have that like extra bit of support really although it's it, it is hard as well though because obviously you want them to succeed and they want you to succeed but you know sometimes there's competitions where one one of us is doing well and the other isn't and vice versa so th- that situations I guess quite hard like I think you've got to be quite um sensitive about how you um go about those kind of things like you know if you're super happy and celebrating then the other of us is like a bit upset and (laughs) kind of down but I think we're both very good at balancing that but um I mean whenever like someone there's been a few times in the street and someone's like seen an Olympic t- tattoo or whatever and they've like asked us or in an Uber or something they've asked us about the Olympics and it's always like Luke like says what I've achieved and I would say what he's achieved so um rather because I think we're both quite humble so it's quite nice to just be like oh well he's achieved that like don't don't focus on me so um it's quite nice because we're both just like would rather talk about each other's successes rather than our own so um yeah no it is good it's so sweet and it's so lovely as well to you know you support one another I guess with uh, it kind of slightly on a left track but hopefully it kind of tie, ties in every athlete go, you're so positive and so happy and I can't imagine that you'd ever have a bad day I feel like you're always just so you're, you just take things as it comes but have you ever had a day where maybe you you do struggle and maybe it's maybe not going according to plan whether it's in competition or in training um how do you overcome that you know does Luke help a lot with that or is that something that you do personally yourself um it'd just be intriguing to see because I guess it's the highs and lows of being uh being an athlete yeah I think I'm probably quite 
an emotional person when I race when it's I don't know when it's going well or when it's bad I'll probably cry either way but um usually just like get it out you know and just like get it out and then move on I think I'm quite good at that like I don't kind of hold on to it for too long um and Mel's really really good at just dealing with whatever emotions I've got going on um because I think I'm quite a generally quite a level person like especially like during training blocks and you know you always have ups and downs sometimes you're training well sometimes you're not you just kind of got to accept it and you might have a bit of a, a wobble one day but you just kind of move on from it um but I think in competition it's a bit harder to just bounce on from it because obviously it's the thing that you're actually like that's what you've worked towards so then when it doesn't go to plan it's you can't just be like oh well the next day it's kind of like this this was it and it didn't go to plan so that's quite a bit harder to move on from um but I mean for me I always have a lot of races a lot of relays so that's quite important for me to be able to just put a race behind me and move on um and usually for me it's just get the emotions out and then park it move on um but yeah Mel's usually the one that gets out of me um before anyone else because I don't I don't really like show duration in front of like loads of people but Mel's always just seems to know she knows the thing to say that will just set me off um but then like she'll talk me around and it's all good and then move on to the next um but obviously like because I think last year there was so many competitions it was pretty tough just like bouncing onto the next and if you weren't happy with the last competition you just got to get yourself together and move on to the next one so it was pretty tough but um yeah both like Mel and Luke and well everyone was just supporting each other because we're all going through the same thing really super important to have the relationship with your coach I think that's really important as well as everyone around you to help you through the the tougher moments but to have those people that know how to handle you we all need those people um it's it's really good and yeah. uh, Mel is wonderful we all know that Mel is absolutely wonderful and she's amazing at what she does clearly that's, that's great yeah. now I'm going to finish on the cliche question but any younger athletes that are watching this because they will be because you're a superstar Anna what advice, just give me one piece of advice you would give them who are going, starting their journey or are very young in that journey so far? I would just say be open and honest with everyone kind of related into your journey, like coaches, parents, teammates, whatever. Because I think I was always quite a shy child and when I was struggling with balancing school or not enjoying swimming I just kind of like let it all just sit inside me until it got too much and just I was just like okay I'm stopping swimming I can't do this anymore whereas maybe if I'd communicated a bit better with parents and coaches and just said this is too much at this point is there any way I can take a step back and focus on like just make sure I've got time for my education or I'd really love to do a session of running instead of swimming just may just maybe it would have been a bit different like it would have all gone down a bit differently but um so I think that's just my main advice would just be completely open and honest because I think you know if you're if there's a, I'm, like people are in your corner most of the time you'd hope like if it's a coach or a parent they want to do what's right for you and they want to help you but obviously if they don't know what you're going through then how can they so yeah that'd be my main advice well thank you for that really important I love that piece of advice as well I always go by honest communication so I think that'll really help um people if if anyone that's listening listen up listen up but thank you for your time definitely watch out for Anna Hopkin I'm sure you all are anyway but we are behind you we support you we love what you do. It's amazing to watch your race. So good luck with everything moving forwards. Oh, thank Hannah, you so much. No problem. Hannah, anything to add there? Yeah, it was just good luck with the up and coming competitions and safe travels back from your training camp. And yeah, all the very best for your next, well, this season. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. No problem. Um, so like I said, thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. 
anyone that's listened thank you for listening we're sure you've enjoyed the episode and we will see you next week for another episode <laughs>